Thrilled to have here on the show for the first time. Uh, we're in year seven. It's been quite some time, and uh, thrilled to have here the Academy Award-winning actor. He won. Uh, he won the trophy for his fantastic work in Manchester by the Sea. He's got two films to talk about right now. Uh, one, he's in in both. Uh, Our friend, which is available now in select theaters and on demand, as well as The World to Come, which he, he stars in and produces. That's available in the middle of February and then in early March. Uh, on digital. Um, he is Casey Affleck. How are you, sir? Hello, Rich. How are you? Thanks I, for having me. You bet. Uh, appreciate you coming on here. Let's uh, let's talk a little sports first. Let's uh, let's let's jump. Uh, let's dive in first. Are, are you, uh, I imagine, um, big time Boston sports fan? Is that a fair assumption, sir? That's a fair assumption. I grew up in Boston. Uh, I played sports my whole life. I still play sports. I loved them. Uh, I've worked. I worked at Fenway. Uh, sports have always been a big part of my life. So, uh, um, yeah, Patriots, Celtics, Red Sox. All right, so let's get into it. Um, working at Fenway, did you? Were you a vendor? Is that what you're saying? I was a vendor, man. I started out. I was uh, I was 13 years old, and um, and I was playing on a baseball team with some older kids, and and uh, those kids played on a travel team with some coach who had a had a stand at Fenway. His dad owned like a, a vending business. Um, and they just thought it would be funny, I think, to bring the younger kid along. You know, we would go and work. You know, after school, you show up at like 3 o'clock and you get ready and you work the whole crowd coming into the game and then the crowd leaving. So you're not home until 11 o'clock at night. I don't know. You know, my mom let me do this. Um, made pretty good money. I worked a lot of games through uh, <laughs> like eighth grade, freshman year in high school. Um, so, and in the middle of the games, there'd be everyone would be on the inside. We were on the outside um, on Lansdowne Street. And we would go into the game. We, you know, we'd give like sausages and hot dogs to the kids, the other guys who were working the uh, turnstiles, and they would let us in for free. And we'd go find seats. So I saw, I don't know, you know, a hundred games at Fenway. So uh, basically, what you're saying is uh, a patron wanting to put down their hard-earned uh, American dollars to see Mike Greenwell and Boggs and Marty Barrett and Spike Owen go at it could have bought a, a hot dog from Casey Affleck. Is that what you're saying? I'm sure they did. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the John McNamara managed 1988 Red Sox pretty much I'm trying to do the math in my head right here yeah so. that was those are the years of like Morgan Magic we got uh okay. when um uh he came in and and um we won 20 home games in a row or whatever and uh there's a lot of Lee Smith I remember we worked right in front of this bar um called the Cask and Flagon of course and uh after the games, you know, we'd still be cleaning up. The crowds have gone. Half the team would come out and go into the cask and flag. And, and the, the dude I worked for who owned the thing, he would go in there, too, and have a few pops. And, um, and those, that was back in the day. People were, rules were a little bit more relaxed. And, and I would go in there and just wait for my ride home, you know, and sitting around at the bar. And it's like Lee Smith is having a few. And, um <laughs> That was a fun time. I imagine so. Man, oh, man, oh, man. Uh, so what's your uh, feel watching Tom Brady do what he's doing with Gronk for another team right now, Casey? I'm like. really happy for them. Happy for both of them. I love it. It's amazing. If you can't appreciate what, what Brady's doing now, uh, you just don't love sports. I mean, it's um, it's just incredible. So I'm rooting for him um, and, uh, and Gronk, too. And, uh, I mean, I think that they're going to be – Wishing they had brought along uh, Stefan Gilmore um, in the next game, it's going to be it's going to be tough for them. Um, but I I I've got faith. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, um, and and I know um, you're you're a diehard. Uh, you said Boston sports fan. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, if this uh, voice rings a bell from back in the Deflate Gate uh, era, from about uh, six seven years ago. Go for it, Mike. I talked to f football players, pro football players. Across the board, they think it's. Does that name, does that uh, voice ring a bell to you, Casey? <laughs> I recognize that hysterical <laughs> rant. Yeah. Do you speak to football You're still players? Still talking or... about the place gate. Come on. <laughs> no, I'm just. Let I'm just, it go. No, no, I'm just wondering if you speak to football players across the board as much as your brother uh, does. <laughs> <laughs> All the guys I talk to in the NFL. Yes. <laughs> That's our. We've been playing that sound by drop for for several years because that I, I just love. He's just he was into it, man, and 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 that's the passion of the Boston sports fan. Is you know is that you you just back your guys and that's it. End of story.
You know? That's right. And and Tom and Gronk still feel like our guys. I don't I don't begrudge them for moving on. Of course. You gotta you gotta go find uh new places to grow and you need to grow, so um I'm rooting for him. And I, you know, we noticed as well, Casey, uh, that you have thrown out a first pitch at Fenway Park, and we've now established that uh, you grew up in that building. What in the world was that like for you to do that? That was that was incredible, man. I wish I had warmed up a little bit. I got a better yeah. arm than that, okay. but um, you know that that was really that was really an honor. Just just bizarre. Are you saying you didn't throw a strike? What happened? What happened? I don't think I threw a strike. Uh, I I didn't get I didn't get the it was. Uh, it was in the dirt. It was in the dirt. Look, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. The re- it's good that I don't know the answer to it, Casey, because if you had if you had done something horribly wrong, that lives on YouTube for absolutely ever. So the fact that I don't know whether you threw a strike means that you were you were serviceable enough. I I did one once in Dodger Stadium. And the thing that you don't know is that you, you have to throw the ball up in the air. You feel like when you're on the mound, because I'm assuming you did do it from the mound, right? Because yeah, you're real, yeah. you're real deal. So you, yeah, you're not gonna do you're not gonna just stand in front of the mound and throw it. You're gonna do it from the you're gonna do it from the rubber and the whole thing is that you, you if you throw it down, that's when you dirt it. M- mine would have uh, fooled a left hander, uh, but hit a right handed batter. <laughs> that, that, that's what my pitch would have done, you know. Um, it's true. You know, I guess, uh, I didn't end up on YouTube and, um, <laughs> that like 50 cent or somebody, it wasn't embarrassing. Correct. Uh, it was, it was close, but, um, you know, I, I've gotten more into sports and uh, the, the older I get and obviously the harder it is to play and, uh, the fewer places there are to you know, let me play. But, um, I just, I just love it. It's become a bigger and bigger part of my life. I wish I had, just given my all to being a professional athlete somehow um i got a friend who says that we can if we could hack the onside kick somehow we might still be able to <laughs> we could volunteer for for a professional football team if we could just figure out how to do that one thing somehow um but other than that i don't have a i don't stand a chance in hell being able to okay. actually play but i play in a baseball team out in in la and yeah. um that's been a lot of fun. We started that like ten years ago, and I know you had John, John Ham on your show. Yes, uh, Ham plays in our club and um, club. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he plays in your club. Okay, yeah. He's uh, he's pretty good, and um, okay, he's, and uh, we have uh, we have a lot of fun. So it's kind of worth it. You get into your forties, and it's. Um, I mean, we start. I started this sort of ten years ago. So so what do you play? Where, where where do you play out there? What do you play? I play third. Hot corner. First. Yep. Hot, hot corner. Hot and, corner. So hand plays first. So if you're scoring at home, it's it's uh, the the five three put out is is <laughs> Affleck to ham. Is that what you're saying? I'm like on your him. club. You know, it hasn't been called on the radio that way yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's my job to say things that way. I, I'm sorry. I slip right into it, Casey. I can't help myself. <laughs> I can't help myself. Yeah. So that's it. Five three. That's the put out. You're the hot corner man. Anybody yeah, else that we know I, on your team? I put, on your club? Uh, mm-hmm. Well, one time we played with um, Matt Moore, the quarterback of the. He was then playing in in Miami. Okay. Uh, we go up and play at uh, San Quentin. We'll take the team up to the the prison in San Quentin and we'll play ball up there. And um, you know, uh, it's it's a great experience. They have their own baseball team, and uh, so they love having guys from the outside come in and play them. And uh, we were short a couple guys one year. Um, some guys just didn't get cleared. You got to like, you know, make sure you don't have a record and stuff. And so um, we went up there and we, uh, a friend uh, knew Matt Moore. And so he invited him up and, um, you know, the, the guys in San Quentin got a real kick out of that. When they I realized think. who he was. Um, and uh, I don't know who else. Was we? we had a guy, we have a guy who played with the Mets as one of our best pitchers. You know, when we went up to San Quentin, man, it was the most amazing experience because this is the first year. And you go up and you, they just put you out in the yard. Uh, there's nobody with you. They just say, look, we don't, you know, sign a paper that says you understand we don't negotiate for hostages and go on in there. And Get out of here. Are you serious? Seriously. And so you, we go, and we, it's like 8 in the morning or something, 7.30 when they put everyone out there. So we go in and we play two doubleheaders. Uh, we play a doubleheader. We play two games, so the little sort of lunch break in between, and uh, when the guys have to go back into their cells and be counted, and then they come back out. And um, the first game, uh, you know, we beat them, and um, we went back in there for the second game. And these guys, 
they were they were upset. You know, some of them knew who I was a little bit, but right. they just generally knew we were like these guys who'd come up from L.A. Um, and they really wanted to win. And um, it was like one of those situations you, you imagine when you're a kid in the backyard and you sort of like paint the picture for some at bat. It was the – this was the – the last inning, and uh, we were up by three. They were the home team, obviously, so uh, we had our <laughs> yeah. best pitcher on the mound. Yeah. Yeah. There was two outs with bases loaded and a full count, and a guy hits a walk-off grand slam out of San Quentin to win the game, and they went crazy. I mean, they, it was like they were so, so happy. Um, the celebration lasted 20 minutes, and then um, and so that just felt great. That was the best feeling I've ever had losing a baseball. No game. kidding! Oh my gosh! So I don't know. I'm like, is this? It's like stir crazy, like or the baseball version of the longest yard in a way that you're going up there and you're you're playing against these guys and a double header. <laughs> you beat them in the so it's a split. You, you, they took the nightcap. Is basically what you're saying in yep. this thing, man. What a story. Um, and it's a, it, feels, it feels great for them. You can tell how much it means to them to be able to sure. go play ball. I mean, a lot of them were athletes. <clears throat> there was a guy there who was a shortstop. Um, he had been scouted by the Indians and the Royals when he was 18 years old. He was an incredible athlete. He had gotten into the, uh, a car uh, uh, with a friend who had committed or, uh, murder that same night earlier, and he didn't know it. Uh, he, and so he was arrested as an accomplice to murder. And, uh, when the police pulled the car over later, um, and when we played with him uh, a few years ago, um, he had been in prison for 15 years. Oh, my gosh. And he missed his window to play uh, professional ball. So then the next year, he made parole, and he was out. Casey Affleck here on The Rich Eisen Show. Let's talk about your movies here. I'll make that heel turn. Uh, our friend is really intense, sir. I mean, and it is based on a story in Esquire where um, – you, you, you play the uh, husband who's losing his wife to cancer. She's been diagnosed terminally, and Jason Siegel plays a friend that comes in to try and help um, in a very difficult spot in a situation. Beautiful movie, sir. Why did you want to make it? Why did you want to do it? You know, I, I like the story. I like the people involved that are making the movie. Um, yeah, it's just, a, it's just a movie about people showing up for one another when it's really hard. Uh, it sort of reaffirms the great and sometimes forgotten value of friendship uh and i like that message um you know uh this guy jason siegel's character it's, it's a true story these are all real people and i don't really know them but you know based on uh, what people say about them and what was the research the, the writer did i i feel like i do and siegel's character has got his life is really is empty and my life is in crisis and uh he drops everything and he shows up for me and so it's sort of it supported that old adage that it, you know if you need a friend be a friend, uh, and I thought like that's a that's a pretty good message. You, you shot it in Fairhope, Alabama, where yeah. the real story where the real that's where the real story took place too, right? Yeah, yeah. Huh. That is just really. I mean, um, man, you do some deep, intense movies. Uh, I mean, this is. It, it, uh, is it a choice that you you do this, Casey? I mean, they won't let me do comedies. <laughs> They've, I've, I've. Uh, you tried, I've, and they just won't let you do it, huh? I've, I mean, they just as much as you try. Funny, you want to be in a comedy, you're going to have to be funny. Um, I don't know. I, I, I like some of these. Yeah, I'm drawn to these to, to dramas, I guess. Um, but they're not the movies I watch. You know, when I'm sitting at home, I'm, I'm putting on World War Z and uh, you know Moneyball and tapping out. Yeah. Uh huh. And then the world to come. You you produce this as well. Uh, takes place in the nineteenth century uh, in, in the northeast of our of our country. And uh, I'll give you the floor on why you wanted to produce this and what people should uh, check out. February twelfth in theaters, and then on digital on March second. You know, I did a movie called The Assassination of Jesse James uh, by the coward Robert Ford, and the guy who wrote that book became a friend of mine. Uh, it was based on a book, and um, Ron Hansen. And I asked him, "You got anything other stories you want to tell?" And he sent me two, and one was about this Cuban uh, baseball player in the in the '60s. And I, you know, I'd been to Cuba when I was a kid, um, and I loved baseball. I thought this was perfect. And then I read the second one, and it was about two women on a farm in the 19th century who fall in love. And I had never been a woman on a farm in the 19th century. I didn't know a lot about it, but it was a really moving story. And um, 
I just I just loved it, uh, and I said, okay, let's do that one. And he and uh, Jim Shepard, another uh, writer, they wrote the, the script together, and it took about six years or something. And um, you know, I don't know why why, why I always pick pick movies, but uh, it's usually just if I read it and it and it uh, I love it. You know, either I think it's funny or it's exciting or it's moving or something. And so that one we went and got um, Catherine Waters and Vanessa Kirby to great actors yeah. and uh, they star in it and um, it's a beautiful little movie you and Christopher Abbott as well again it's called the world to come and everybody should check it out on February 12th digitally on March 2nd and our friend is available uh, now in select theaters and on demand before I let you go I just want to do a couple quick hitters on some of your other uh, films that you were in Casey is it sure. true is it true that all your lines in Goodwill Hunting are ad-libbed there were no lines for you in that you ad-libbed them is that a true story they had lines for me I just didn't say them <laughs> <laughs> there were written lines, not okay. many. All right. Believe me, all the best lines they could come up with, they gave to themselves. Um, <laughs> so. Right. So how far off were your lines from the written page then, Casey? I can't remember. The, I can't remember the written page on that, on okay. that one. Um, I had done a couple movies, mm -hmm. and I had worked with the guy who was directing that, Gus Van Sant. Um, I had already worked with him, and I was at school, and I really wasn't that interested in going – leaving school to go and make that movie, kind of sit sit around in the background, sit mm -hmm. in the back seat of the car while those guys played Hero. And, um, but <laughs> they they uh, they kind of bullied me, and, and so I did it. And that's why I just tried to ruin every scene by making up my own dialogue. Oh, no kidding. You're real, so there was, uh, how, I guess I should say, how about them apples is really what I should say <laughs> right there. I'm sorry. I, I, yeah. I should go nail that one. Uh, and you, give me your best ocean story. Give me your best ocean story from that set. You got one? <laughs> I know you're laughing because I don't know how many of you can actually tell. Um, but give me give me a good one. You a, know, a good ocean what, story, Casey. What, stays in, uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. I've heard of that. Yes. Yeah, we we shot. Um, let's see, the best uh, best uh, ocean story I'd say is uh, radio friendly. Um, <laughs> is that you know I had a kid. My son was born on that movie. Uh, that's hard to. That's hard to beat. Uh, on the second movie in Amsterdam, we were shooting, and mm -hmm. that's when my first son was born. Um, that's not the kind of story you were hoping for. That's I think, okay. But um, it was 2004, and my next son was born in 2007. I don't know if those years mean anything to you. Um, but then, I, you're going Red Sox on me there, there you aren't go. you? Okay. God damn it, you're good, Rich. <laughs> so. Uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, I didn't have another kid in, uh, the next time, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess if you don't want any more children, it, it, it's good that Mookie Betts is no longer on the team. Oh, Casey. Man. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I heard, man? I listened to that in your interview with Anthony Mackey. I thought that was really funny. And I worked okay. with Mackey and, um, you asked him for his best story from, yes. uh, from, from uh, whatever he did with the Eight Mile, yeah. Uh -huh. That was a great story, man. It was great. Well, I had no idea. So I don't, I don't know if uh, I have no idea if like uh, Clooney came up with lines to give you crap or, or anything. So I guess let me let me ask you this then. Uh, did you guys like play poker or whatever on the set or anything go down? I mean, it, I mean, yeah, I do? can't even really remember being on the set. All that I really remember was the times afterward. I mean, it was it was a lot of poker. There's a lot of hanging around. Everyone's in the same hotel. I mean, we shot the first one in Las Vegas. Amazing. So I lived in the Bellagio for, I don't know, three months. And <laughs> I, I don't remember going outside that much. Uh, you go into one of those casinos, you, you could, you know, there could be an apocalypse happening. You wouldn't know. <laughs> right. Just everything got food. Anything you need is there. Um, I liked one of the things I remember is that the producer Jerry Weintraub, sort of famous old movie yep. producer, he really liked to take care of his big stars, which I was not one of them. Uh, <laughs> so you know, there's eleven guys. I was like number eleven. Um, <laughs> And uh, but and it made me mad because I sort of thought like why are these guys they have all their food and their you know their laundry anything anything they need handled is handled <laughs> they have people already who can pay, do that they don't need they got all the money in the world they can pay for their own food but every time I had to sign a check you know at this casino restaurant I was paying that bill man so I just start, got everyone else's room number and I would just start signing yes signing and yes that went on for a very long time. Uh, <laughs> Jeez. The payback for that was that on the, I guess it was the 
second movie or some third movie or something, I showed up and um, this was Jerry Weintraub's idea of a joke. Uh, I barely even noticed, but it was, uh, you know, they had a, you'd go to the set of one of those movies and there'd be like a long line of 10 of these like luxury trailers or everyone, you know, sure. between their scenes they get to go hang out and it's like bigger than my house. <laughs> and there's uh, 10 of them and then there's a little, there's like a small used tent that has been set up for me to... <laughs> To me to spend my time in um, so <sighs> those sorts of things went on all the time. Um, that was a good group of guys. I don't know if you've read Don Cheeto on the show. He's a great of course, guy. Absolutely, we've had him and you know Matt Damon and um, you know uh, I've I've and Soderbergh. You know, years ago when we we were a podcast before we were this show, we had Stephen once. We had him uh, be the media critic for a Super Bowl like to just look at the Super Bowl and talk about the play-by-play and the broadcast and what it looked like. And it was dynamite, as you might imagine. It was just, he is truly one of the greats ever in just a brilliant mind, and um, I can't say enough about him. That yeah, guy. very very talented guy. You know, we would shoot uh, Be Done by Lunch most of the time. <laughs> That's what, And I've never met anyone. And then he would be editing in the afternoon. He yep. would kind of do it all. And he played ball, I think, in... Um, he played uh, he played uh, baseball in uh, college, I think. I can't remember where he went, but he was an athlete too. I think he's a Carnegie Mellon guy or something like that. I think he's a Pittsburgh guy. I don't know off the top of my head. But at any rate, hey Casey, I appreciate the time and the uh, the conversation, and uh, let's do this again. Thank you. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Great to talk to you. Right back at you our, again. Our friend available now in select theaters and on demand. The world to come available in theaters February twelfth and available on digital Tuesday, March second. Casey Affleck. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.